No trader in our firm's history has gone from beginner to making seven figures faster than Max Gaddick. And in this video, he shares secrets, secrets from how he grades setups to how he uses daily levels and volume indicators to predict movements with amazing accuracy. I'm Mike Bellafuri, and we're one of the top proprietary trading firms located in New York City since 2005 and proud to develop number seven and even eight figure per year traders. Watch, take notes and learn from a star young trader on our desk so you can grow your trading account. So this first, a little quick background. I started at SMB in um, January 2020. Um, and that was basically just um, right after graduating school. So for me, first focus was being able to find my strengths very quickly and being able to size those up. What specific trades was I able to see clear edge in and put on real risk? So that comes from then grading setups, right? What trades are A's, A pluses, B's and C's, right? So for me, let's say for an A trade, I'll be looking at what is the R vol, what is the overall daily look like, and then what is the, the, the uh, intraday setup, right? Each big trade allowed me to reset overall risk. Being able to use that big win to then use that as a leverage point to then size up. So I'm gonna go over two of my biggest trades at different points in my time here at SMB and just why I put those on and how I use that to further build up my playbook. First trade is gonna be Amazon from 2021. So if you see this chart, if you look basically at July, it was basically um, right before July 4th, that green bar. This was my biggest swing trade at the time. So like, let's see why this trade was an A trade for me. Well, first, it was a very clear daily level, right? Clear flat top, and then on like, the volume side, you can see the um, volume bar, which are the bars below the, the um, chart here it was very clear that that day before that big green bar had a acceleration in volume, telling me that if this were to follow through, that there were real traders that were putting size for this breakout. So we have a few um, checks in our favor, right? We have our vol, we have a daily look, and then overall on the intraday, it set up well as well. It was not too aggressive of a move. VWAP was pretty close to where like the close was. So in terms of where I am gauging risk, it usually is to um, VWAP, which becomes two day the following day. And that is a good way to try and figure out what is the, the RR of the trade. So now what the next part is, which is what really creates this to be a true A trade, is going to be on the option side, which is the way that I express this trade. So before the breakout, implied volatility, so how expensive these options were, was not that high, implying that like, the market was just assuming things were going to trade in a normal range. Now, buying these calls, I'm thinking about what is the RR if I'm right? Well, if I'm right, I would think that the following day, it is going to break out through this level, bringing in more volume, and then also, because it broke out over a very clear level, everyone is gonna be buying calls, spiking up the implied vol. So by taking the options trade, I'm not only betting on a direction, I'm betting on range expansion. I'm betting that the option market is wrong in what they are saying, and that I think that the actual movement of the stock is much greater. And then you see the following day, it follows through, and however like, you see fit to take off that trade. Now, some could say, well, why is it that the A plus trade is not buying the close on the following day? Incredible Arval, close super strong, right? 
for me at least, the reason is that it just made a massive two-day move. You paying up there, what is your risk if you're wrong? On the option side, it's the most obvious breakout in the world. You paying top tick in terms of the vol for the option means that if you're wrong, you will, will overall just lose way more than if let's say you were wrong on that first day. Because for that first day, if let's say in the best case, I'll make three, two, five X on the option. And just being safe, assume probably around a 50% loss, right? That means that if things go as planned, it will be at least a five to 10 RR trade. If I'm paying top tick on the option that following day, probably means that in a decent case, at best one or two X, and it's probably gonna be at least a 50%, if not more loss, because if it fails, implied vol is gonna fall so much because everyone is gonna be puking those options. So now, if that trade is at best a three to one, well, that's probably more like a B trade. If in the long run, even if let's say I'm only right 50% of the time, even 40%, frankly, even 30% of the time on that specific anticipation trade, if it's gonna pay me out 10 to one, right? You look back in five years, these are gonna be the trades that will take you to the next level. These are gonna be those moments where you have that big win that then you can grow from. So this very specific example allows me to then dissect what parts of this were an A trade. It was the volume, it was a very clear um, level, and it was an excellent RR. Next trade. So now this chart is FXI, which is the ETF that tracks Chinese stocks. And this is from 2022. So as you can see in the latter part of February and then in the beginning of March, that there was a very clear downtrend. And it was slowly starting to speed up. So the way that, that I structured this bounce trade was two part. One, it was around, I think it was, if you see it on the chart, that first kind of breakaway day before that, that big bar. Um, so three bars before that March 14th, I bought puts and then bought stock. So here, I'm basically saying that I think that if this were to bounce, that I can at least pay for those puts. But what I really wanted to do was as it was falling, buy more and more stock against those puts. And because that bar to me was a sign of range expansion, I felt that the implied vol was wrong. I thought that we were gonna truly get that wash where I could buy stock on the wash at points to which I thought was a really attractive buy, have the option be effectively my stop loss if it kept going down, down, down. So that way, once you see that turn, you have all of this stock boxed and then it would turn back up and then you would sell the stock. And then as you can see here, the trend accelerated. So the faster that, that it's going down, the more of a sign that a bottom is near. You want to see true panic. You want to see some change in characteristic. That is something that we never really saw in the latter part of, of um, 22 with kind of more of like the bear market, which definitely made that a much tougher year. Is that things just kind of grinded down and down and down. But there was no true acceleration that made any bounce trade that opportune. So here, what you can clearly see is that you had those three big days down, and then finally, that turn day. From that turn, that was your first sign that a potential bottom was in. Now, there's one unique edge here, is that this has a very unique ability to gap because these are all ADRs, so they trade overseas. So seeing in the US that finally buyers stepped in supported VWAP the entire day is your first sign that potentially overseas markets will see that as a sign of support and then follow through. So buying calls on this day made sense. Now this trade ended up working way better than anyone thought. I think that at the time we were just kind of hoping that it would fill that first gap. So just for um, context, uh, where it turned was basically 
25, 26, and then each little bar is around $1, so that first gap is 29, and then the start of that big green bar would be 30. Um, so on that morning, we were like, wow, this is an incredible gap, and we boxed it, and this is also probably the worst win that, that I've ever had, because if you see um, selling that morning basically was the worst decision, because it closed like three times higher, uh, so it was the worst, almost like seven-figure win that I've ever had. Um, but, you know, I'll live with it. It's fine, you know. <laughs> now, also going towards what, what is not an A trade. Well, you finally see this big turn day, massive volume, like the most volume that, th that this is ever done by a factor of two. Are you going to be that trader buying the close when it's up probably three ATRs from the open, and it just turned probably eight ATRs from the prior day. I mean, it is the first um, turn day. Well, it's very clearly a sign that your RR is not there. One, you would be buying a close that is right back into daily resistance. One thing that I'm always looking for for swings, or even just for breakout trades, is what is the overhead in that trade. If there is overhead, it is much less likely to work. Why do you think that, that for example, a NVIDIA breakout at, at um, 500 or any front side breakout is so much better than buying a mid-range breakout that could, you know, like for example, two weeks ago, NVIDIA did like the, um, you know, like the huge like stuff bar and then it had one sideways day and then on the intraday, it had a very clean look, which was probably a B trade and it broke out into the close. But that trade failed because when it gapped up, it was immediately at overhead supply. So these are factors that you have to think when it comes to trying to gauge RR. So now for um, risk management. Overall, I like to use each big win as kind of a guide for what I can risk going forward. Usually when things are going well, most of your big trades will work. For example, for me, A trades I would say work at least 75% of the time. So I want to be able to say that I really shouldn't give back more than half of that last A trade. And it allows me to have a clear point to which I need a mental reset or a playbook reset, a sign to which something is going wrong. Now, in 2022, I did not do this well. From, I think it was July of 22, to September, I basically gave back half of my year. So now what I did from there was go back to basics, right? Focus on A trades. Focus on what I know I do best and cut out everything else. How do I put a bottom or a trough in my P&L and then start to build back up? And the exact same mentality. Once I finally turned, how can I use that last win to go from there? So if let's say like you're down a million bucks, right, from a, uh, just like worst case, how could I go from being from minus like one million to then only down like 750? Great. That is now the worst case. Under no circumstance do you let any big trade get you to worse than that low point. And if you do, something is really wrong and you have to see why your A trades are not working. And you keep building and building and building and it gives you that mental comfort to push size. So especially like when you're falling, it's so easy to think what is the worst case. But once you find a mental point where you feel some sort of relief and you're in the right um, mindset, it's much easier to think even in a, a drawdown, okay, I'm only really risking this little part of my um, bounce back and just like focusing and not getting below that worst. So now speaking about C trades and, and expanding playbook, right? One of my main focuses for the last year has been to improve my intraday trading. A lot of my wins earlier on came from pre-market, after hours, small caps, swings, all sorts of things. But besides very specific situations, I wasn't that good at those um, pattern trades, those very clear intraday trades. So starting out, and still now even, on certain intraday trades, 
is using C size. Something that is not really going to impact my week, right? But something that I can build from, get the experience, and then grow from there. You know, for example, even just three weeks ago, there was a AMD breakout through 184. It was pretty fast off the open, but it was a very clear daily level. So I bought C size versus low a day. Something that even if it stopped out, it probably would not even impact my day, right? But it got me involved, it was a clear idea trade, and from that point, I could build it back up. Now from that breakout buy, it went up around two points and then it washed five points. Now the entire time, the stop was low a day. But if I was sized as an A trade or a B trade, I probably would have puked that because I was not comfortable being in big size for a trade that I truly have not mastered, right? And frankly, I'm not even that, that um, um, good at. But I am good at identifying the overall picture. So then using that C size to then build up for the swing later. It then ended up bouncing back and, and I was able to scale that C into a B and so on for that swing. Also, just with other um, intraday trades, if you can get better with that specific intraday trade and now you're seeing, well, those C trades are actually um, working a good amount, well, now that can become a, a B trade and so on. Every trade has to start from somewhere, but it's important that you separate it out so drastically from those A trades so that way what is making up the week, the month, the quarter is going to be those huge trades. That is really is what should be defining your overall success. And then lastly, truly just like um, focusing on areas of strength. So when I started out, I was really, and you know, for the most part, like this still is my like main strength, is going to be quick momentum, it's tape, it's scalping. Especially early on, 2020, there was so many fast momentum trades that, that were truly A trades, every day, nonstop opportunity. So why would I ever put like myself in a situation, either in a front side trade or some trade where I would have to hold for hours, right? When I knew that I should be utilizing all or most of my mental and actual um, dollar risk on the best possible setups and the thing that could get me to, to uh, succeed. Because, because especially early on, the whole goal for me was how do I size up? How do I increase my stop? I think that you could probably say that maybe one or two years in after you are consistently profitable is when you want to more so experiment with C trades because you are that much better at being able to, uh, to identify those small variables that could potentially make those better trades. So now for teamwork. So one thing that, that I'm sure that many people have uh, spoken about are joint trades. So one thing that the people that I work with in pods are better than me at are intraday trades. That is especially just like something that they mastered a lot quicker than me and something that I'm able to grow. So a, a specific example from this year would be the NVIDIA 500 break. So this trade, the first part of the leg is something that I'm good at. It, it was super fast to off open, buy the breakout, and in five minutes you made 10, 12 points. The benefit of the joint trading account is that we can use everyone's skills to, to um, master the overall trade. So on the joint, this is where we put the idea size. This is the, the idea that this is a six month breakout that should probably go at least 40, 50 bucks over the next few days, right? But if I was doing this trade just on my own, I know that, that I wouldn't manage that idea trade properly. But being able to use um, their skills as well as mine to, to identify points of getting involved, but then also on the the exit definitely helped. Also, in terms of risk, sizing up a joint trading account, or at least, like let's say, on the retail side, if you specify a certain amount of capital to which you 
will be trading just in, in a group trading atmosphere, it's a lot easier to size that up when you're working with people rather than putting all the pressure on yourself for sizing up. And then just being able to separate out those sizes. Now, in terms of just the people that you are working with, throughout time I've had different trading pods. You know, it started out, I was on someone else's team, and then one or two years in, or I think it was two years in, I started um, my own team. And ensuring that when you are in these pods that there is not too much of a group think there. Because the last thing you want is for everyone to think the exact same, where you're basically just trading on your own. You know, you have to be willing to either move pods or, or just ask people to, to leave. Even just three weeks ago, I had to, uh, to ask someone to leave the call. Because the way that, that they were trading was they were sizing things in such a robotic way where he was sizing the, the uh, NVIDIA breakout trade the exact same way that he was sizing a mid-range on the daily sub-view off buy. I don't trust someone that is, that is making that game time decision to be on the call. Because if this person is there, what if they talk you into or um, out of a trade? If they're there and they cost you a big A trade, think about what if that A trade was the thing to just reset your entire mentality? What if that was the thing that could have taken you to the next level? So I think just ensuring that you are surrounding yourself with the right people is critical. And just overall finding people that give you positive edge. So Dr. Steenberger talked about it. I think pretty much all of us have talked about it, the importance of working in teams. I see people passing out, it looks like contact information or like a list so people can coordinate. You just spoke about this. The importance of recognizing that this team currently isn't working. Yeah. So can you talk through a little bit more about what does work for you in a team? Absolutely. So I think that understanding everyone's trade process, understanding that the people that are in your team have the, the uh, emotional uh, intelligence as well as a process that you respect. People could trade totally um, different from you, right? As long as you think that the process that they are, that they are following offers you edge, that is key. You know, I've been in pods where they are front side traders. They are buying dips, selling pops. I am, for the most part, a momentum chair, so that's not my thing. But being able to understand why they are doing something offers me edge. Why are you buying this dip? Do you agree overall that the stock should go here or here? As long as you respect that process, they will offer you positive edge. Because keep in mind, you being on a call and speaking about where you might trade, there's just so many people that you want to speak to to the point where what if you rob yourself of your own edge? Because if you're saying I'm going to buy X breakout on a small cap, if you're saying this to 50 people that offer you zero value, if then everyone goes in and buys that breakout, you're probably going to create slippage and a potential that the trade would go the you know, like that much worse. So ensuring that everyone in that call is offering you as much edge as you are, are offering them. So you're an active trader, not doing as well as you want, not doing as well as you deserve, and you just can't figure out why you can't become profitable no matter how hard you try. Well, let me show you why. This is your competition, the traders in this room. This room right here is full of elite traders, some of whom are making seven, and even eight figures a year. In fact, our top guys have made nearly 20 million each in net trading profits in a single year. Let's head to my office so I can share more. So you're probably used to seeing videos of lavish trader lifestyles, trading gurus, trading off of a laptop for an hour a day, heck, maybe even 15 minutes a day, and then them relaxing on some secluded beach for the rest of the day. Well, all I can tell you is that our traders train 
like pro athletes. They live and breathe the markets and are continually working on their trading skills. Because at our firm, that's what we found it really takes to make it in this game. I'm Mike Bellafieri, co-founder and managing partner of SMB Capital, one of the world's top proprietary trading firms located in Midtown Manhattan. And we're always looking for trading talent to hire and develop. And not just to trade in-house on our desk, but also to trade from their own home, entirely using our firm's capital. And we have numerous traders doing just that, allowing them to make upwards of seven figures trading the firm's capital without risking their own money. But to even get a shot at something like that, you need to have the right training. That's why we're doing a new free online presentation in which we share how you can get an interview with SMB to become an in-house or remote trader, trading firm capital without risking yours and gaining access to all of our firm's coaching and resources. And the best part, you don't have to be a profitable trader yet. In fact, we prefer to mold profitable traders with our methods and our techniques. That's why we have just three simple criteria that can earn anyone an interview. We're looking for highly ambitious and determined traders who fit our culture first and foremost. So if you believe that could be you, sign up for the free one hour online presentation by clicking the link that's in your top right corner of your screen now.